Good morning, church. My name is Pastor Aaron Grote. I get to serve here at Calvary. Welcome to you this morning. Now, listen, I want to ask you a question. Why are you here? Ooh, someone said, ooh. <laughs> I thought about roving through the audience and ask you specifically why you're here. But knowing that that would probably put the fear of the Lord into your heart, we'll waylay that for right now. But let's ask the question, why are we here? Today is a perfectly great day to sleep in. Today, I tell you, it was the right temperature. It was the right, like, feeling. Like, my bed was so... Is anybody else's bed cozy this morning? Yeah. Why did you leave it? I know. It's your spouse or your loved one made coffee, and it wooed you out of bed, right? But why are we here? That question is one I think that all of us as Christians need to ask ourselves over and over again. Why do we get up, make our way through empty streets to a building built in the late 1960s with people that are different from me, some I like, some I'm learning to like, <laughs> sing with a worship band that are not professional musicians but have a heart for the Lord, who love Jesus, who want others to know about Jesus. Why are we here when we have two greeters on the front desk that, or the front there that welcome you in and you, know, you don't know them and you feel awkward because you have to shake their hands or you have to say something to them nicely, but really you're like, I'm not even sure why I'm here. The question of why we gather together is one I think that over the last maybe four years, we've had to wrestle with, all, all, all of us have had to wrestle with about why we are here, why we gather together, why coming together makes sense. Now listen, as we come to this message, I realize talking to you here, I'm almost preaching to the choir because you've chosen to be here. But honestly, why am I at this meeting of the church. For some, it's habit. It's what I do. I get up on Sunday morning, I do this. For some of you, it might be to please someone. Maybe you have a spouse, and maybe you differ on your, your belief, but you know, you promise your spouse, all right, I'll go to church with you. Fine, okay? Maybe some of you are here thinking that just by being here, that I'll curry favor with God and that he might just give me a good week ahead if I get my body to church. So why are we here? Pastor, I'm here to worship our God. Great. That is fundamentally the priority of why we gather, to worship our God. It is important. Us singing songs, reading scripture, listening to the word preached is important. We call this reorientation. We all need it. After a week of living out there, we need time to kind of get our thoughts back, to get our thinking back to who's ultimately in charge of this world. And we do that through worship. And that is extremely important. I never want you to hear anything different this morning. But can't you do that at home with a worship soundtrack? And Dr. Jerry, Jerry who's it got? David Jeremiah? Some preacher that you like to hear who's a lot better than this preacher. With worship bands, they're a whole lot better. And I love our worship. Don't get me wrong, guys. But you know what I'm saying, right? But you're here. We are here. We live in a strange day. We live in a day where there's more than six billion people in this world. Yet if you ask people what their number one need is, they would say, I need relationships. We've never been more connected in our world, but never more alone. We've never had so many people who we could consider friends or followers online. But yet, if you're in a pinch, who would you turn to?
So let me ask you a question. Why are you here? Why are you here? Friends, this morning we are gathered together because we were created for God and we were created to know God. Yes, we were created to worship. And if we do not worship God, we will worship something else, unfortunately. But we were designed and created also to know God and to know each other. Right from the very beginning, God said it's not good for a man to be alone. And what did he create? He created someone else to live in a relationship with that person. To know God and to know each other. To love God and to love each other. Someone write that down. That should be a mission statement of a church. We were never designed to do life alone. We were never designed to walk out our faith, walk out what it looks like to love God and love people. We were never designed to do it alone. But precisely that is the lie that the majority of us have bought into over our years, thinking that this gathering together, this meeting, this connectedness is something that we can simply check optional on our list of things to do. It's why we make a point in our church membership covenant and as you journey with us at calvaryburlington.ca slash membership, you'll see our, our membership covenant laid out there and we're, and we're walking through it to kind of give us a picture. What does it look like for us as a church to follow Christ together, to grow in discipleship, to grow in our walk with Christ? That's why we make a very strong, bold statement about what it is about being together intentionally in relationships here at Calvary Burlington. And this is what it says. Now understand, this is not Scripture, but we believe that this flows out of an application of Scripture into our lives. We say, we will not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, nor neglect to pray for ourselves and for others. And then we put some verses at the end of that to support that from Scripture. We take this priority that is given to the body of Christ to be together in relationships from Hebrews chapter 10, 23 to 25, in which the author of Hebrews writes, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as some are in the habit, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Why we gather together is, comes and flows out of this passage. And I want you to open your Bibles to this passage. Now I put it on the screen and we'll come back to it in a second. But I want you to see it in your own Bible. So open up your devices, open up your scriptures. I want you to see how this passage comes together for us to give us the reason to the question of why we put a priority on gathering together. We've talked about this passage before. This passage here formed the framing of our, uh, the beginning of our series for why we need a body to walk with, why we need the body of Christ to walk through and walk with our faith together. This passage is, is written to a church that was feeling the pressure of conformity to the world, feeling the pressure to kind of turn their back on their faith and do their own thing. Hebrews is written to them to remind them of all that God has done for them in Jesus and why being around Jesus and being about his mission was such a priority. And he calls them in this passage here in, in Hebrews chapter 10, and if anyone's looking to memorize a passage, I think verses 19 to 25 would be a great passage to memorize. Because in this passage here, we see that we need to hold fast, hold fast to our faith. That there is a persevering nature to our faith. It is not a once done and never to be looked at. It is once we believe that we are to press in and press on. We are to continue to persevere in our faith. So how do we persevere? How do we continue in our faith? 
Well, in verse 23 of our passage here, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And then it says that what you do regularly about surrounding yourself with the people who also believe that they need Jesus is vitally important. Hebrews is basically saying that you cannot completely have confidence in your faith before God unless you are connected to the body of Christ that is going to remind you of that assurance, of that confidence. Yes, it's true. Christ has given us the confidence because of his death so we can stand before a holy God. Absolutely. But we cannot endure or persevere in isolation. In other words, we need the relationships that the body of Christ affords. And for this assurance, we need continually, continual reminding from other saints to keep going, keep trusting, keep looking to Jesus. We are called to bring out the best in each other in our walk with God. We are called to actively and verbally as we're going to explore this morning, do certain things in which we will actually motivate and continually motivate us to keep on keeping on. An unhealthy church fails to remind each other to keep going. A healthy church is one in which the body of Christ understands that the relationships that we have need to be grow and need to be fostered, need to be nurtured in such a way in which we regularly are connecting with each other as we connect with God. And out of that, the writer of Hebrews says, health flows, spiritual health. And so as we meet together, there needs to be space in our meeting together that will help us to grow. We have said from the very beginning of this uh, series that community takes commitment and commitment takes community. Our commitment to Christ, our commitment to community, we need each other. And if we are going to grow as the body of Christ, as Christ wants us to, it takes a commitment to certain values and certain, for certain um, expressions. They're going to prioritize certain behaviors, not in, a, not in a legalistic way, but in a way that is healthy and Christ-formed. But we're also going to live out our com commitment to Christ and to each other by being in community. So how do we do this? Why do we gather? And how, when we gather, how do we continue to encourage each other to keep on keeping on? Well, luckily our text, look at it, does not leave us without an answer to that question. That as we hold on to our faith, uh, the confession of our hope without wavering, the writer of Hebrews says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Church, I propose to you this morning from God's word, the authority of God's word that would say to us that we stir each other up by making the relationships in the body of Christ a priority. Yeah, I know it's an, aud an audacious claim. But what Christ wants for his bride is to be a bride that is not just meeting together and going on our own way, but it's meeting together, connecting in such a way that there are relationships happening that are a priority, that is given priority, that stir each other up. That's the biblical word here. Stir each other up. Let's look at our text again. I put it on the screen again here. I want you to notice some very key words in this text this morning. And as you have it in there, underline it here. But as you look at the text, some key words we need to unpack this morning is, first of all, let us consider. There's a reason for using that word, let us consider. And then we need to look at another key word of stirring up. Stirring up to what? And we will talk about love and good works. 
But we will also look at that word neglecting. And what does that mean? So as we unpack this verse this morning, this morning, there is lots here for us to understand. The key word here is that in some way, even in the book of Hebrews time period of the early church, that there was a sense of the church neglecting or forsaking, as some other translations say, not making a priority of the relationships that are needed to help each other grow. This word neglecting here means a willful neglect. And this pushes that word into a matter of the will, a matter of the heart. It's a heart issue. That for whatever reason, there were people who were neglecting those relationships that were in the church that were vital. And it's a strong word. This word neglect is used a few other places in the New Testament. Means to willfully neglect and abandon something or someone, often for someone else. Now, in the context of the church that the, the author is writing to here, and you notice I use the word author, the author of Hebrews is never truly identified. We can make a case for who it is, whether it's Paul or Apollo or one of the other uh, relig- the leaders at the time here. So I use the word author here. The author is not telling us why they're neglecting. We can only make some assumptions. Maybe it was that there was a heightening pressure that was threatening the church to stop meeting together. And therefore, this neglect of relationships was something that they were doing because perhaps they were feeling the pressure from the world around them. Maybe feeling the pressure of persecution or even laughter or reproach. Perhaps they were feeling as citizens in that, in that village or in that town that they were feeling that, you know what, it's, it's not worth it. This is too much. I got my own faith. I'm good with Jesus. He's good with me. I just can live it out my own. And the author is saying, you know, you're missing something here. You're missing a vital aspect of why we meet together, why the church needs to prioritize relationships. Maybe that's one reason. They were feeling the persecution. It was just as easy to stay home or stay away. Or maybe is because, as you notice at the end of the, of the text here, um, there's a reference to the day of the Lord. And I surmise that maybe people were just feeling it like, okay, he hasn't returned yet. Is this really true? Why are we doing this? He hasn't returned yet. He said he was, and he's not. Maybe they're feeling that, God, you've forgotten us. So what's the point of pouring intentionality into relationships? Regardless of what the reason was, for whatever reason, the author of Hebrews is pulling the church back to a proper understanding of how they persevere in their faith. If they truly know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, is the Messiah, is the one who died on the cross for their sins, that this confidence that they can have in Christ is to be lived out in relationships with other people who hold that same faith. They were to continue to connect in relationship with both God and each other But more than just connecting a relationship, sometimes I think we think church is like kind of some big kind of family reunion where you just stand around awkwardly and pray for it to be done. You ever been to a family reunion like that? That you know the family's a little tense and you're just kind of standing in the shadows going, "I'm just going to show up, do my time, and get out." And I think sometimes that's how we view church. I come in, do my time, pray that nobody talks to me, nobody asks me any kind of question of how I'm doing, because then I'm going to feel pressure to tell them how I'm doing, and then they might know that I'm not doing very well. I think sometimes that's how we view church. And Paul is, sorry, I almost gave it away who wrote it. Apollo, whoever, wrote here that, listen, the intentionality of relationships as the church gathers is huge, massive for us to continue on. And so we are called to not neglect those relationships. 
but rather to consider. And consider means a word of is a word of intentionality. Consider how we continue in relationship with each other, and go further than that is to stir each other up. Now, I must confess that I did not get out of bed thinking, I wonder who I'm going to stir up this morning. Did you? I know it's a, it's a weird way to talk, right? We think stir it up. Like, what? Really stir it up? That just sounds like you get stirred up to make someone angry. Ah, you're stirring me up. Don't make me angry. Well, the other part of this is true here is that we are to stir each other up to a few things that we'll unpack for the purpose of encouraging each other, of mutual encouragement. I love that word stir up, though. It's in the text, so we got to handle it. What's that word mean? That word means intentionally rouse to activity. Here's <laughs> provoke. Now, one of the things that we say to our kids, don't provoke each other. Don't start. But you know what I'm telling you, church? Start it up. I want you to provoke each other. Now, you can provoke each other to two different ways, right? Provoke each other to anger, or you can provoke each other to the things that the writer here, that Jesus wants us to provoke each other to. Those things that, and I love another translation as they try to kind of put it together. They say, spur one another on. Just like a cowboy or a cowgirl spurs the horse to get it to go. Our job here is just to stick it in our sides and get us going. Yeah. Some of you are like, I can get behind that. But you put together these ideas, the fact that we are to spur one another on or rouse to activity or provoke with consider, and you have a formidable admonishment to the command to not neglect meeting together. Why? Because there needs to be in our life as we come together as individuals in a family called the church to seriously consider, to pay special attention to how we will encourage each other that day and the rest of the week. It's not the pastor's job only to encourage you. Our task as members of the body of Christ is to, when I come together, how am I going to use my time together to spur another believer on in some way? If it works for you, how are you going to jam the spurs in someone else's belly to encourage them? Because I think we all understand it's hard to be a follower of Jesus sometimes. You work in places that there is no mention of God. You work with people who would cut your throat to get ahead. You go to school with people and all they know about Jesus' name is that it's a great way to cuss. And you live with people that always, that just their priorities. What can I do to get ahead? And suddenly now you come into this place and you got to think, oh, I need some encouragement. I need someone to provoke me. Not provoking to anger, but provoking to love. I need someone to come beside me who understands that there is a part that they play that nobody else can play. And that is to encourage each other. So we need to consider that special word that is used to give careful attention to stirring each other up so that in a healthy church, it becomes a chain reaction of love in community. There is a personal call here for everyone who calls themselves Christian, those who have repented and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, that why we gather together is because the church needs you. And by the church, I'm not talking about a pope or a bishop or anything, or even a pastor. The church, us, we need what God has given to you to bring, to encourage each other. And if we don't make that a priority, those relationships that we are missing out, Jesus is intended best for the church. It, there's a lie that's been developed over time in the Christian church that faith is just a private thing. That it's just something that, well, I made my decision. It's mine. 
I don't need anybody. Don't ask me about it. It's a private thing. We have bought into that lie. We have bought into the lie that faith can be lived out in isolation. Thinking that we can do life without God. Sorry, think, thinking that we can do life with God without each other. And I find it fascinating that if you do read the Bible, that you will notice that in the New Testament, most of the commands are given in the third person. That famous, you all. There's not a lot of commands that are given to you, plural, like you individually need to be. It's you all. It's that you are the body of Christ living out in relationship with each other, working out your salvation together, working out what it does look like to love God and love each other. And so as we gather publicly to worship God, we do so in the context of others who have committed their lives to Christ and his kingdom also. Why? Because we are here to spur each other on, to encourage each other. Gathering one another to encourage one another in relationship with God through Jesus and encouraging us to live those personal relationships in such a way that as the text says, let us consider how we can stir one another up. I guess the question needs to be asked of you, do you believe your faith is a private matter? If you do, you're missing out on God's primary means for how you grow spiritually. I'm not saying you can't grow without others. There are many people in the world who there is maybe perhaps a singular gospel expression and God, by his grace and through his spirit, works in that person's life and there is growth. But if that is a healthy growth, there will be another one and another one who comes to faith. And pretty soon, you are not alone and there will be the need to have relationships with each other. There's a true saying that's forged in the, in the experience of being part of Christ's church for a long time. That when someone stops coming to church, and by that I mean prioritizing the relationships in the local church, it's generally an indication that either they're in sin or they're about to be. Because there is something in our sinfulness that drives us away from relationship. Perhaps some of you need to hear that warning this morning, that if you feel that life, that your faith is just for yourself, take special care. And it's important for you to understand that we need to make sure that relationships are given priority. Because when we're struggling with sin, the last thing we need to do is to avoid being in the church. Because that is a lie from the darkest, deepest part of hell. If you're here this morning and you struggle with sin and you're struggling to make it as a Christian, you are exactly in the right spot. Because you know what? I didn't check your card and so I see on your card that you're perfect. You didn't check mine because you'll see I'm not perfect either. Precisely where we need to be is the recipients in worship of his grace and his mercy and with other brothers and sisters who will love us and walk with us and encourage us in our faith journey. To avoid church, to avoid those relationships, there is a warning there. But if we're here today, how do we stir each other up? What do we stir each other up to? And the text is clear. It doesn't leave us hanging with that. Let us stir up one another to two things, love and good works. Now, a case can be made that you can put these two things together, love and good works. That's just one big idea. I, I think that one leads to another. First one is love. And we unpacked that last week. And if you weren't here last week, I encourage you to go back on, on our website and listen to last week's sermon as we looked at what it looks like to walk out in love, about living out with affectionate care for each other, watchfulness, and at times, exhortation and edification if necessary. But you can't love someone that you're not walking with. You can't walk this out in isolation. I, now, we don't have the time to explore all of this again. I'm going to have to depend that you'll go back or at least reflect on what we talked about last week. But the writer, he says, let us consider how do we provoke each other this morning to love each other better? This is one of the one another's here, to love one another. 
And one of the greatest ways in which we can demonstrate and show love for each other is by time spent with each other. Who can say you love someone you don't know? And through acts of love, we encourage one another to continue on, to press on, to press into Jesus. To live out lives the way that Jesus has called us to love each other. And so as you put this together, we need to have a deliberate plan in place, in our thinking, in your thinking, that when you come together, how will I provoke love in my brother or sister this morning? How will I grow in that? Some of you will maybe start, start very basically. I'm just going to get to know them. But the second one is good works that he mentions here. To love and good works. And I think love flows from this one into the good works section. There are good things we do for God and for each other that will encourage us in the faith. See, the good works is love expressed in action. That action can be very general or very specific. Did you know that the odds of you speaking that greeting this morning, uh, how do I say this properly? That chances are that there's people here that you are the first person to talk to them this weekend when you greeted them this morning. And through that smile and through that greeting, that you created that human connection with someone who perhaps is craving it. Did you ever think about that? Love expressed in action. Walking with someone, helping them learn, helping them grow in their walk with Christ. We need to be actively doing things in the church. Our motivation for loving each other and these good works is because Christ has saved us. He's rescued us. He's redeemed us. He's shown us his love so that we can love each other. Someone should write that down. That sounds like a Bible verse. See, it's easy to see church as something you just attend, something you go to. But here the author of Hebrews points us to a path that is simply not about attending a service, but rather engaging in a way that is intimate with one another, encouraging one another, stirring up love with good works. See, these are admonitions that aren't fulfilled at a distance or simply by attending a service. These require us to be together in proximity, sharing experiences, even working together. And by God's grace, this is the kind of church here at Calvary that we ought to be a church that is committed to relationships in which we can live out love and good works. So what's the so what here this morning? As we draw this to a close, as we wrap up, as we ask those questions, those applica application questions, what do we say? I propose we need to change our perspective on gathering together and remind ourselves that it is important. If you're going to take one thing from here this morning, here, there it is. We need to change our perspective. Our perspective on gathering together. I believe that this perspective is not a once and done. This is a continual perspective that constantly needs to be reaffirmed in our life. That there is a reason for us gathering together, of being together in relationship. There is a reason for you to be vulnerable. There is a reason for you to be loving. There is a reason for you to care about other people. Why? because other people and our lives depend upon it. Our continuing in the faith is rooted to this. As we walk in our faith together, we need each other coming alongside, helping and caring for each other. And we continually need to be building this perspective together. But more so, we need to tell ourselves also that it's important, giving it priority. Now the text here implies why it's so important and why it needs to be given a, a priority. And he says that. But encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. What's the point of that? Well, you know what? We need to prioritize relationships with God and each other. Why? Because time is short. Pastor, this was 2,000 years ago. Jesus hasn't returned yet. Well, you know what? The text says he can return at any time. 
The people in the book of Hebrews time, they lived that Jesus could return at any moment. I think sometimes we've lost that. Yeah, we say it, but we don't live like it. I want to encourage you to see your church with this perspective. And here it is. This could be the last time you see each other. This could be the last time we see each other before the Lord returns. This could be the last time that you or a loved one could ever have a, a point of communication. That drives me to see what we do as a priority because we need to see it. I want to encourage you this morning. Christ has not returned. And for that, we recognize that he is holding back so that more people can believe. But if we knew that this was our last Sunday together, how would that change the way in which we talk and speak and love and do good works with each other? If you're not plugged into a church or not committed as a part of it, or not a member of this church, let me encourage you to take care of that ASAP. Plug into a church, get committed, get connected. Because we do not know when the Lord returns and our time is short. And every Sunday... May, maybe other times during the week as the church connects. Let our motivation be, how can I glorify God by encouraging other people in the church? Rather than thinking of church as a place you go to have your needs met, to view the coming together of the bride of Christ as such a beautiful thing that you say, I'm going to provoke someone to love today. I'm going to spur each other on. There might be one person that God puts in my path by his sovereignty that needs just a gentle love, a gentle connection, or an encouragement. There may be someone that needs a little bit of the sticking in their ribs because they're walking into sin or they're messing around with sin and someone, a loving brother or sister, to come alongside and say, listen, let's do this. Let's figure this out together. Let's go to God. What happens when an entire community of people gather together regularly with this on their minds? I'll tell you what happens. People will notice. People will notice that people care about them as they are part of the family. And as a church grows, that just means that the family has to break up into smaller parts and becoming new family members in all of it. And our family extends but you show me a church that genuinely cares about being together and looks forward to their, their mission of, of loving God and loving each other, and I will show you a church in which God is glorified and people will grow spiritually. This is God's design for the church, and if we honestly believe that the Lord is returning at any moment, which I hope that we seriously give thought to the implications of, then we need to be thinking about how we need to be alert and ready and be needing to remind ourselves and one another that we live from day to day in anticipation of the big day that is to come. And so we ought to consider how we can spur each other on to keep going until Christ returns. Now listen, I'm not being a legalist here. Far from it. Legalism says you get your butts in church because you just got to get your butts in church. But what grace says is that God has saved you because he sent his son Jesus and he has given you the opportunity to live out your faith, your walk with each other and spur each other on to know more people. That's why you get together. That's why relationships are the priority. And as we move closer and closer to the day of the Lord, the author of Hebrews expects us to grow in faithful commitment to these things. A final note. In our membership covenant, we, we put at the end of this, and, and perhaps, Pam, you could do some gymnastics here and pull up that first, uh, that first phrase of the co of covenant. Pam, I think I owe you a coffee after this. All right, there it is. And pray, and not neglect to pray for ourselves and for others. We put that in there intentionally. And that's a final note about prayer. Because you can't pray for those you don't know. You can't pray for those who you do not know and love. As we gather to worship, 
as we gather for fellowship. It's more than just having fun. It's about connecting on a level that we can pray for each other, that we can give priority to praying for each other. Not just the big requests, but even the day-to-day stuff, to know each other in such a way that we care so that when we pray, we pray for each other. To keep going, to keep serving, to keep loving. To pray that God would use them, that God would uh, just empower them by by his spirit to live a life that pleases Jesus. This kind of prayer happens when a church understands why gathering and connecting is so important. So as we gather to spur each other on, not neglecting to meet together, but spurring each other up to love and good works. Why? So that we can know each other, love each other, and pray for each other. It is for these reasons that we seek for our members here at Calvary to be engaged in this mission. And it's not just simply attending a discipleship group, although we encourage all to be part of a group. But every part of our ministry here is designed to build relationships in. You see, for us, our ministries like greeters or prayer or kidsmen or worship or whatever you can think about is not just getting together to perform a task, but it's ultimately about the body of Christ coming together and building relationships in the body of Christ in such a way that we can help each other to grow spiritually, to provide opportunities to stir one another up, to love one another, to do good works side by side, motivated by the truth that we are united in our love for Christ and his church. Every position of service here at Calvary is intended to provide the opportunity for you to build relationships with God through Jesus and with each other. So we need God? Absolutely. We need worship? Absolutely. Critical. Massive. But we also need each other. Stirring each other up to love and good works. Praying for one another. And we need a renewed commitment, Calvary. We need a renewed commitment in this day and age to those kind of relationships. That will spur us on to be the kind of church that brings glory to God and that people love to be part of. So why are you here this morning? I leave you with that question. And if you're here, what are you going to do about it? Father, thank you for your word this morning. It speaks to us, challenges us, forces us to understand why we are here. And we thank you that you have not left us high and dry with no answers, but you've given us your word that teaches us how we ought to come together regularly in relationships to spur each other on. I pray that that question of why we're here would sink in deep to our hearts. Spirit, speak to us. Go into those deep places of our heart. Why we're here and what we're going to do about it by your grace. In Christ's name we pray, amen.